All right, so in this tutorial, I'm going to explain how I make my sound font covers. Um, so the first part is going to be the setup in the software that I use. Um, the mixer I use is synth font. Um, all of these are going to be linked in the description below if you want to download them and mess around with them yourselves. Um, in order to get this, uh, the mixer working, you just go to synth font downloads right here. You go down here for synth font one because it's the free version. You're going to install it. And then once you have it installed, all you need to do is um, run it. Um, the next thing that I primarily use for um, actually editing the sound fonts is um, this thing called Polyphone. Um, Polyphone uh, allows you to create your own, modify the samples in numerous ways that many, many things I don't even understand. Um, the next part is just going to be how I create my visuals which is through this application called Corescope. It is written in Python. Um, and the GitHub is right here. All you need to do is go down here to releases. You're going to click on the latest. And you're going to download yours. It's only for Windows, though, however. Um, download like the 64-bit. Um, I want to say there's at least one dependency, but I believe it, um, when you run the pro run the application, it'll install it for you. Um, but it's right here. Um, so those are the primary softwares that I use. Um, now, as far as actually getting sound fonts that you're actually going to use, um, the primary one I use is the Explorers of Sky sound font that was organized by Rattel Raichu. Um, this is where I found it. Um, he actually organized it using Polyphone as well. Um, and you just go, I believe the download link is right here. Yep, so he has all of the samples, the sound font, uh, which is this one right here, which I have modified myself. Um, and I also occasionally use some from the first Pokemon Mystery Dungeon game, um, which I actually have sort of organized, not really. Um, you can find it right here. You just download it from this drive link. Um, I don't have the progression included in it because I have not bothered to organize it. Um, I mean, it's really messy. It's not very uh, clean and organized. Um, but I have most of them labeled almost correct. <laughs> but anyways, um, there's other ways you can get them just by Google searching. For example, if I wanted to find, say, Pokemon Conquest. And you should be able to find, find it um, fairly easily. Um, this link is going to load. Well, it's not loading. Okay, um, let's just do Pokemon Black and White. All right, sound font. And all you need to do is find the correct thing. Retreat. Yeah, I think this is it right here. But anyways, um, you could also go to Synth Font. Synth Font actually has some free sound fonts that you can download. Um, but really, Google is your friend for finding them. The next part is actually finding arrangements. Um, the primary source for most of the arrangements that I use um, is from this website called VG Music. Um, VG Music is basically one of the oldest uh, video game mu music archives out there. If you go to their website, I believe in the bottom, yes, it was established in 1996. It is one of the oldest websites um, as far as um, video game music is concerned. But anyways, you're going to go to um, Google search VG Music Search, and you're going to see newly submitted files. You just go there, and you can basically select 
the game name, the song title, whoever uploaded it, the game system, anything you want. So, for example, I could say game name. Let's look at Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. Search. And you're going to see the games here, the titles, whoever sequenced them. Um, most of like my um, uh, Gates to Infinity and Super Mystery Dungeon were sequenced by somebody. Um, he has sequenced so many. Um, it's kind of insane. Um, yeah, as you can see, all of these Gates to Infinity. But, yeah, I mean, whatever game you could think of, um, another way you can search for it on this website is by going back to the home page. And you will see here they have it organized by the actual console. So if you wanted to look at, say, a Game Boy um, game, they have them in alphabetical order, so you could just search through here until you find them. Um, now, the other place that I um, find arrangements is MuseScore. However, um, I don't really like MuseScore, <laughs> um, primarily because it's not really, it doesn't convert well to um, MIDI. Um, however, you end up having to do a lot more work to fix it up so that you can actually use it. So that's part one of this tutorial, is just just this, just this um, showing you what I use. Um, the installation is fairly simple. Um, you just go over here, download each one of these. Um, Polyphone is optional because you, you might never want to um, edit the sound fonts because that's a lot more advanced. Um, but the visuals are the main reason why I started making these um, sound font covers is because I was fascinated by waveforms. So that's one of the main things um, I'll be covering at the end of this tutorial. So um, now you have your, your um, sound fonts, you have your mixer, and you have some MIDI file. Um, so for example, let's open up um, synth font. If it's going to open up, come on. There we go. So first thing you're going to want to do um, before you mess with anything is you want to go to set up and options. Um, so in setup and options, the only really thing that you need to make sure is correct um, is over here in doo -doo -doo, synth engine. You're going to want to make sure you have the correct sample rate. Um, mine are 44,100 hertz, which is the CD um, standard for audio. Um, and you want to make sure you have maximum polyphony as high as you can go. <laughs> Because polyphony is basically um, more than one um, source of notes playing at the same time. So basically, it was um, invented way back, a long time ago, when um, synthesizers were still being, were still new. They were being um, made. Polyphony was basically a way of having more than one note play at the exact same time. Um, and generally, um, this is a really good, uh, polyphony to have. It's a lot. You really won't ever have to get to this point, but I mean, it's there. Um, you can mess around with the handling of overlapping notes if you have issues with your MIDI here. Um, but it's mostly just, you want to make sure your sample rate is, uh, high enough to where um, it's high quality. Um, however, you are still limited by your sound font. Um, let's see what's next. Um, what makes up a sound font? Um, we're going to open Polyphone, Polyphone, and I'm going to show you what makes up a sound font. So, let's just go into the sound font that I work on. So as you can see, um, when you open it in Polyphony, you have a description, you have all of this stuff. Um, so the samples are actually 16-bit. 
Um, and if you go to the samples, you'll see a lot of um, a lot, a lot of samples. But basically, you're going to see that the sample rate is very different. Um, so you'll have at least um, 44, 100, but it can go a little higher sometimes and a little lower, as you saw right here. That was 32. Um, it really doesn't matter, but um, basically um, the samples are the raw waveform. Um, so as you can see, let's just play the flute one. This is a very, very short sample, 0.3 seconds. And the screen bar right here is actually when you reach the end, it loops back here. So this was organized by um, Rattel Raichu, but um, you can actually change these. And Polyphone actually has a toolkit that allows you to auto loop it. So it'll detect where it repeats, um, which is really handy. Um, but anyways, basically you have your samples, um, then you have your instruments. So your instruments are actually, if I open up, let's just do this oboe, right? Where was the oboe? Ah, whatever. That's oboe all samples. That's a custom instrument that he made. Let's do the bassoon. So the bassoon right here has three different samples, uh, a C1 sample, a C2 sample, and a C3 sample. Um, if you go to the piano roll, you will see that each one of these samples covers a range. So the C1 sample covers this part, the C2 sample covers this part, and the C3 sample covers the rest. So if you click on the keyboard, it'll play it. You see, that's not very audible. <laughs> Just like that. Um, but the way you basically create an instrument is you go to your sample and you click right here at an instrument and you will create a new instrument based on that sample. It's fairly simple. And then once you have your instrument that you can change all these parameters for, right, all of these weird parameters that don't make a whole lot of sense unless you really understand them, you're going to go up here and create your actual preset. Now, these presets are actually what show up in your editor. These are the finalized um, parts of the sound font, or I guess instruments, um, but they're called presets. So you'll see right here, this is an instrument. So if you click on it, it'll bring you to it in the instrument section. Um, there's a lot in here, um, a lot that I really don't have time to cover, um, but you can you can modify all of these things in so many different ways, but that's basically what makes up a sound font. Okay, so, so now you know what a sound font is, um, and now you have this configured. So one of the main um, parts of synth font that is really nice to have is you go to sound font, you can go here. I usually don't go there because I if you click here, it'll open up a lot more options. So you can just uh, select your channel, um, which uh, every MIDI has channels. So track one, track two, track three. Um, you select your channel and you could change the sound font. So currently I'm on the general MIDI, um, which is just a generic um, sound, sound font that this editor provides for you. Um, and the MIDI file that I have for this um, example is just a mar little simple Mario tune. But anyways, um, what you can actually do is you click here and you can go to define sound font overrides, or you can change the default one. So if you go to the default one, when you, when it, when you select the default sound font, everything that um, is basically 
every every channel has a mini program and it, and it is going to have um, a default that is selected so if you go in here and you change it to for example a different one you'll see all the presets here um, and what you can do is you can have your default sound font be like a general MIDI or whatever and then you can define overrides so these overrides will override your default sound font so what that means is say I want to have something from Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Sky um, override the default one so I already have these basically done all myself um, for the most part um, but you can select for every MIDI program what instrument you want it to override. So like the accordion, for example, I have uh, an accordion from uh, Pokemon Black and White. Um, because there's no accordion in the Mystery Dungeon sound font. Um, this timpani I have is from a different rip. Um, but basically, all you need to do is just click on it and then select your sound font. So I think I have this in music. So if we're going to go down here. Yeah, just like this. So you open it, and then you select the preset right in here. And that's all you need to do. Um, you can even overwrite the progression. But I generally don't, because most of the MIDI that you have is going to be um, made for general MIDI. And the percussion of Pokemon Mystery Engine is not made for MIDI. Or I guess it's not made for general MIDI um, compatibility. But that's basically like the main um, functionality that really makes SynthFont stand out is that you can have your overrides. So that is the sound, sound font um, configuration part of SynthFont. Then the other part is actually right, right, right around in this area on this half of the screen. So say I only want to um, look at one track. So you, you can select here for, for um, selecting one track to be solo. You can click on it to select multiple. And when you play it, now only counter melody is playing. Now just the bass line. Now the melody. And you can change these while it's playing. But the other thing you can do um, is go into the piano roll and actually see the notes on each track. So here we have the melody. Let me zoom in. It's a little easier to see. So. Track two, track three, and the bass line. So these are the actual notes. And you have a little piano, ro piano roll here that you can click on. It works most of the time. <laughs> but anyways, um, what you can do is actually follow the music. And you can see the bars. So every MIDI is divided into bars. And those bars have beats. So this is basically a simple 4-4 four four from the looks of it. But that information, all of the MIDI information, all of the events, all of your volume control, all of your program changes, your programs are basically um, what instrument is going to be set there. So right here, MIDI program the D is set to a, a jazz guitar. And if you go into MIDI events, this part of your editor shows you every event. So like your notes on, your notes off, all of this. But you can, you can um, filter it to see program. Well, there's the program. Some MIDIs will have multiple program changes. Um, your notes on, your notes off your controllers, all of these things. So yeah, there's uh, meta events, time signature 404, and you can actually change this. Um, but the 
The main thing um, that you would use the MIDI events for is cleaning up a really messy MIDI. Um, many of the of the MIDI that you're going to be um, downloading and messing with is going to be messy. And what I mean by messy is that it's not going to be immediately um, like usable. Um, sometimes when you import a, a MIDI file, you're going to have um, channels that are that are not um, all individual. So you'll have like a channel right here. This is channel zero. Um, you'll have like, for example, one of these that'll be set to the two of them will be set to the same channel. And that's not compatible with the way Synthfont um, plays audio. So what it'll do is if, for example, this this channel right here is a different instrument, let's say a marimba. You see, I changed marimba here, but it also changed it up here. The way you fix that is by either changing it here, or you can change it over here, right here. So now, if I go over here and I change this one, it doesn't change the other one. So that's one of the primary um, things that make it messy. You can, in a more complicated MIDI, click track and you can move them up or down. You can organize them by increasing MIDI channel, um, which in this one is very simple. Um, let's find one that's a little messy. Let's go, I don't know. Let's go to this one right here. Oh yeah, here's one that's super duper duper messy. Look at this. Every single one of these channels is channel zero. So when I click play, it's going to sound awful because every single instrument is going to be playing one of these. So most of the time. Um, but um, usually you have to go over here. I think I've already might have already saved this and messed with it. But um, basically you're going to want to fix all of these channels yourself. Um, so you're going to go over here and start fixing them like this. But uh, usually um, the MIDI you have, the channel is going to have a name, and it's going to usually be like what the instrument's supposed to be. So like here, you're going to have your guitars, your, your they're going to name it brass, but sometimes the MIDI program is not going to match up um, this one's not a good example. Let me find one better. Yeah, see, this one this one doesn't have any of that. So you kind of have to um, figure that out yourself, which can be annoying. Um, this one's a really good example of a super messy MIDI. Um, I got this one from MuseScore. And the first thing you're going to notice is over here in volume, this is actually where you change the volume and mix it. Um, some of these, they don't have volume. And if you look down in this, this bottom uh, left corner, it says no notes in track. Well, that's weird. Go to piano note or piano roll. No notes. Huh. Wonder why that is. I honestly don't know. But what you're gonna you're, what you're gonna want to do is actually just delete those so you can actually edit the other ones. So as you delete these ones that have no notes, you're gonna cond condense it down into a workable state. Um, um, some of the tracks are gonna have information about. Um, BPM right here, which when you try to delete it, for example, it's going to tell you this track contains information about tempo and time signature and should probably not be deleted. So you're not going to delete it. So the other thing you can do um, when you have when you when you have something like this messy right here is you're going to want to um, sometimes they'll have like seven uh, mini programs or like changes. Um, and when you go into your MIDI events, you're going to see this thing that says remove surplus events. So remove surplus events is going to delete events that have been duplicated. Um, let's see, there's one. There's one down here somewhere. Uh, this one's this one's not a great example. I mean, a, a thing is, any any MIDI you you get is going to be different um, depending on who actually sequenced it. Let's find one. Let's note a different one. 
system defender. How about that? Here's a good example. So, um, the first thing I usually do is I go over here to track. I do increasing MIDI channels, and you're going to notice right off the bat, this flute part and this strings part share the exact same channel. But it, but in this case, this one doesn't have any notes, so you can just delete it, just like that. Um, so you delete all of the ones that don't have any notes, and then you look and see, well, are any of these duplicates? In this case, there aren't. Um, but in many cases there are, and you will you will have uh, problems with that. That you need to make sure. Well, every single one of these has their own unique channel. Um, one workaround for if you if you're working with a MIDI that has a ton of channels, like more than sixteen, is you can actually go here, and there are two slots for channels, so you can have up to thirty-two channels. So you could go over here and select channel 16, which in this case, since it's zero indexed, it's going to be 17. Um, and that way, um, you can have way more channels than normal, just like that. See, this, this channel right here has two um, changes. So if you go to program changes, for whatever reason, this one has, is labeled flute. And it's labeled flute here, but it has trumpet in there for no reason at all. So you're going to see that both of these um, are on the same bar. It says bar one. So when you actually play it, and I pause this, it's on trumpet right now, even though it's labeled flute. So you're going to want to clean this up yourself. So you go over to trumpet and you just hit delete. Well, now that's gone, and now it's actually what it's supposed to be. This is supposed to be a baritone, but it's, for whatever reason, on acoustic bass. You go, you delete that, and you go to clean up all of the mess, um, just like that. There we go. So, now you can actually start working on mixing them. Um, basically. All of my mixing is done mostly by ear. Um, I do occasionally reference the original material. Um, I mean, most of the time I uh, am familiar enough with the track that I don't have to. Um, so you would basically just get a feel for it. Um, you would get a feel for the track. You would isolate tracks that you think need worked on, like say, well, this track is a little too loud, then you would lower the volume of said track. So let's just get rid of the progression so we can actually focus on the instruments themselves. Let's, um, let's focus. I usually focus on the bass line first, but I don't even know where that is with this one. I guess it would be all the low brass and bassoon. Probably all this right here. Yeah. This is obviously a concert band arrangement because it's um, a bunch of concert band instruments. So you would zoom it out so you can actually see what it looks like. And then you would go see, well, all of these instruments are relatively the same as far as what they're playing. This one varies a little bit. This one's the exact same as the one previous for the most part, except for that one note. Um, and you're basically going to isolate um, what parts of the track um, and what, what purpose they serve. So since we know that this one's the same as this one, and this one's the same as that one, you can just focus on isolating like what core parts of the track there are. I believe that tube is the same as the trombone. Yep, just like that. Um, you can raise the volume. You can drag them. Weird. You know, it's it's kind of hard to work with this sometimes. Um, you can raise it up to two. 
there is a workaround for um, if you need something to be louder than, say, two times. Um, in the MIDI events, um, you're going to see... Oh, yeah, this is super messy. Look at this. Look at all these surplus events. They make it look like a mess. Um, but you're going to see controller right here. Volume course. These are, most of the time, um, the person who made the MIDI is going to just leave it default um, 100. Um, but you can raise it up to, if you click on it, you can raise it up to 127, which um, you can just think of these as multipliers. Um, but there's another way that you can actually make it even louder. So if you go to the piano roll and you select the channel that you want to make even louder, click this little plus bar, plus button, and it creates a new MIDI track. But what you can do is you can copy the data from this track and just have multiple of the same one. Click yes, but then here's the catch. If you have all 16 uh, MIDI channels filled, it's going to say, well, the maximum number of available MIDI channels has been reached. The workaround for this is to go, and you're going to notice it created an empty track, um, which you can delete here. You're going to go, oh, you're going to go to that track, and you're going to select a channel bigger than six, bigger than bigger than the first row of channels. So, say I'm going to make this 16. Now, when I click duplicate, it actually duplicates it because it can only duplicate it in the range of the first 16. So now you can make it even louder. So see how much louder that is? Um, but once you're done with your uh, mixing, you're basically going to play it to a file. What this does is you're going to go somewhere, example folder, um, and you're going to basically um, create your master WAV file, which is basically all of the channels combined. So if I click Save here, and you're going to see the progress, how long it takes. Um, let me open that up while we wait. So you're going to see one, one channel right here. See if it's done. All right. So then you have your one WAV file. I mean, right now this this example is just it's not finalized or anything. It's just to show you. Um, but that's the that's the the master audio. Um, where? Okay, here we go. Well, the, after you get that, you're gonna want to actually separate. Them into chain to their individual files. So when you when you click right here, separate channels, um, and you also want to check this one right here, create long names, because um, if you don't do this, you're not going to know what's on each channel. So if you do this, it's going to say override existing. It's not going to override anything. Um, you're going to go here, and you're going to notice you have the title, um, and then you have the channel number, and then you have the sound font, and then you have the instrument preset. In this case, flute, oboe, bassoon, all of that. Once you have that, um, the final part of this is, for me, is um, uh, actually bringing it into CoreScope um, for the final touches. Um, getting a look at the waveforms to see, well, how big are they? Are they too loud? Um, you also do this with just listening to it. Um, but I'll cover that after I finish up with mixing. Uh, let's see if I covered everything. I got the setup and configuration, overrides and channels. Um, I guess that's one other thing I should have covered. So you're going to want to save often. Um, and whenever you modify the MIDI, it's going to ask you to save the MIDI itself. So we're going to save the MIDI, and then we're going to remove surplus again. Well, let's see. Okay, there it goes. And then if I remove surplus from this, that removed 10,000 events. 
which is massive. And then you're gonna it's gonna want you to save it again. Um, you can go over here and actually save this as a different MIDI in case you want to keep the original, in case you mess up along the line. Um, but that's like you wanna you wanna save um, because while crashes are rare, they do happen. Um, the other thing you can do is instead of clicking this button, you can just do Control S as far as long as uh, many other things do the exact same. You can see up in this, you have a little star that means you haven't saved. When you save, that star goes away. Um, another little shortcut is Alt O, and that opens a MIDI arrangement. Instead of having to go all the way over here to File and click it, you're going to see the shortcuts are right there. And instead of clicking this play to speakers, all you need to do is press the space bar and press it again to stop it. Those are the little shortcuts um, that I've learned. So I covered that, covered that, I covered that, covered that. Looping, that's the other thing. So um, I guess I should get, let me get a different track, one that's short. Um, let's see here. Let's do one that I've already worked on. How about that? Okay, so I think uh, I think this one's already looped. It's already set to loop, I believe. Let me go to a channel that I can tell. So trip percussion. Yeah, this one has a loop. So you see, you see the general structure is these. I mean, you just look for for stuff that repeats. So you have these four down here, these all these up here, then you have those four again, and then those up there. So this one's already set to loop itself. Um, let me find one that actually doesn't have a loop by itself. Okay, so you're gonna look and see, well, looks like this one, this one doesn't have a loop at all. You look for musical structures that repeat. And this track, you're going to see at the beginning, where is it? There should be a string part right here. So there's an intro to this track. If I play it, so this intro is completely separate from the loop, and you don't want to include it. So this little green triangle and this red triangle is basically your start and ending point. Um, your playback range. Um, uh, is basically um, where you want to play when you actually record it or just play it back. You can actually find out where each track starts um, and start from there, or you can go to the piano roll and just click. All you need to do is click. Click on this part of the editor, and whenever you whatever you have for green, um, it's going to start there. So if you want to play a single section over and over until you've um, nailed the mixing down, you will basically just select where you want to start, start it, start it and stop it. Um, but for looping, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go um, to bar beat and this playback range, click loop, and the default is actually infinite loops. So you want to click up, have one loop, and you're going to you're going to want to have both of these selected in most cases. So the before the loop, it's going to start from the beginning, which is the intro, uh, right here. So this is the intro, these two bars, and you're going to want to stop right here, which is actually right at the end. Um, I mean, there's currently no notes at the end of it, but um, in some cases, there's actually a little a little outro of the tune. Um, so basically, you're going to play it, and we're going to wait until we get to the end, and then if you did it correctly, it's going to loop back to where you need to go. So we're getting closer to the end. So you're going to notice when it reaches this red bar, it's going to loop all the way back to the green uh, the green arrow. Now, um, what you'll notice is that there's kind of a jitter in the um, playback. That's just because um, 
when it actually plays it in the editor, it's not, um, I guess, optimized um, for perfect playback. But when you actually play it through the file, it's going to sound clean. Um, but what, what you'll notice is um, when you're actually trying to set up a loop, when you play it, um, you're not, you don't have control of over here. This part of the um, editor right here, this is where you actually can skip ahead, believe it or not. Um, so you can forward to the next marker. So you can, you can, set, you can set markers. Um, oh yeah, right clicking is the green one, or no, right clicking is the red one, and green and left clicking is the green one. Um, but you can actually make your own markers, believe it or not. Let's just um, let's just start at the begin beginning, and you can skip ahead. Um, and this right here, it'll actually show you that you can skip ten bars if you hold control. So we're gonna skip one bar, two bars. 10 bars, 10 bars, and you can go back 10 bars, or go back one bar. Those are your basic controls for that. Um, and you'll notice I, say, I mentioned earlier that um, uh, if you want to make something louder, you can duplicate that channel. So right now, um, the piano in Pokemon Mystery Dungeon is actually very quiet, believe it or not. Um, so as you can see, I have it on 2.0 um, already. But then I have this piano down here as well. Um, so what I did is I went over here. I duplicated it. And if you go down to the bottom, you'll see that's the exact same. So I, I was able to allow for this piano part to be way louder than, it, than you normally could let it be. Let's see. Did I cover? I did not cover the advanced mixing. Um, so most of the time, um, your MIDI is not going to have like very good volume control. Um, a perfect example of this is in a recent arrangement I did. This guy. Okay, so you notice everything's at 100, like all the way. Nothing gets changed since I got this one from MuseScore. It's really messy, um, but what you can do is you can go to your channel as you're messing around with it, and you're going to go down here to Controllers. And in Controllers, you're going to go to Volume. Now, in here, as you drag the bar, you can change the volume in different places so with lines, curves, you can erase them. Um, but with this one, I had to do a ton of editing of volume for specific channels at specific points in the track. Um, like right here, I wanted it to be a little quieter for this part. Um, you just drag a line like this, like this. It's all you do. Or you can have a little curve if you want it to be like, Kind of like that, kind of like a crescendo. I guess a crescendo would be. I mean, a crescendo is usually just a straight line, but you can you can make it as funky looking as you want. Um, like this looks like a mess because it is. <laughs> but um, basically, like certain points are going to be too loud or too quiet that you're going to want to emphasize. Um, just by knowing the track itself. What else did I forget to mention? Oh yeah, so actually editing the MIDI itself, like the the, the notes, that is controlled here. Um, so what you're usually gonna do, let me find one that has like stuff that I can edit. Right. Okay, here we go. So you can select um, a section, like this, and you see what's highlighted in white is what you have selected. Um, so down here, you can edit just a single note, you can draw notes into there, you can batch edit, you can edit the whole track, you can transpose it up um, like a whole octave if you do 12, just like that. You can see that move that thing whole up, that whole thing up a whole octave. You can 
change the note length, you can change the velocity. Um, but another thing you can do is in copy and paste, if you select the buffer where you want this to go, say I'm gonna I'm gonna copy this section I just copied, copy it, and it's gonna show 13 notes that you have copied into that buffer. Well, I'm gonna go into this one right here. I'm gonna paste it. So you're gonna see here in paste that you have your buffer. So you're gonna um, you can select where to paste it at what at what bar. So let's just say 61. Um, paste. And you can see this channel now contains this information right here that I had selected before, right here. Um, all of your like fine tuning and stuff shouldn't really be done in this editor. However, you can do it in this editor, um, which is really powerful. Okay, that is, for all intents and purposes, the end of the mixer section of this tutorial and now we're on to the exporting and vi visuals so once you have your audio let me get rid of this so it don't save i don't even know what i was working on last sure no do not save that <laughs> um close this and you're going to go open your core scope so in Core Scope, you're going to notice a lot of things when you open it. Your usual hotbar stuff, your open, all of that, your save, preview, preview to video. Um, my general setup for, for Core Scope is, um, at least I should explain what this is. Rendering with is what's actually being rendered. So milliseconds is actually the time. Um, the time interval that is being shown. Um, so 60 would be a second, one second. Um, I usually set this to 20 because the higher it is, the more, the less you can see the fine detail of the waveform. I usually set this to four. I mean, it can vary. If it gets too big, you lower it. But you don't have to really change anything here um, except performance for previewing. If you're trying to fine tune your previewing, you just lower or you raise it because um, it's not very efficient uh, the way it's implemented. So let's open this card. Let's open one that I have. This is this one that I was showing earlier. So um, I guess I should just, yeah, let's just make a new. Um, so we have our 20 right here, and we have our 20, and we have our four, right? So then you're gonna to go to appearance and you're gonna to wanna, to, you can change the resolution. I usually leave this at 720p um, because anything higher and it's not very, it doesn't come out right. You can change if it's the lines are colored, you can change, um, this is where I usually go. I only usually ever change this and, the, and this down here. So this is how you organize it. So first I'm going to, just add all of these that we just um, made earlier. Where did I put this example folder? Um, so the way the file structure set up, it'll 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 you'll first first have your master up here, and then your individuals here. So we're going to open these in into CoreScope. So you're going to notice here that you can label them. So let's just name this sax, flute, yada yada. And then you, your master audio goes up here, so like this. Now you can preview it up here. And you'll see 17 tracks, they don't really go into two columns. <laughs> it don't really fit, does it? It'll fit into four pretty well, like that. But still kind of messy. Um, and if you noticed earlier, when we made two of these um, trombone parts, they're, they're the exact same. So I'm going to go back into Synfont, and I'm going to record both of those samples right here. So I'm going to go over here to this trombone part. I'm going to isolate it 
and the one that it was duplicated of. Now I'm going to write this right here, and we are not going to separate it, but we're going to we're going to just make the file different so it doesn't override our master. So let's just put a one there. It's going to output that. So you're going to see. Oops, I should move this trombone part down so you can actually see it. So, and we're going to add this one right here um, just to show you. So, you'll notice right here this trombone part and this trombone part combined make this waveform right here, which is twice the size. So, instead of having both of those, you can just delete them, and now you have your one trombone part. Like that. For bass lines, you usually want a larger trigger width. Um, let me find one that actually, let me open, let me open one that I just worked on. Uh, sure. So you'll notice here I have my labels, um, pulse synth. So this is your bass line right here. And I have trigger width really high. And I usually set progression to around two, two times the trigger width and two times the render width, so it's more spread out. Um, but then you preview just like this. This would be, if I didn't have if I didn't have the trigger width, this is what you would see. Look how look how distorted this is. Like that's a mess. It's a really big mess, but if I have it the trigger with higher, it's much cleaner. I didn't find this out until pretty far into actually um, using this software. Um, but those are really the main things. You can change the amplifi amplification um, of each track themselves. So, for example, I want this, this bass line. It's too big. It's too big um, compared to everything else. Let's just make it one. I mean, this is this is obviously um, deceptive because this baseline is a lot louder than that. But um, if 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 for example everything else you need to be a little bigger, but you need that one just to be a little smaller, you can do that. Um, you can change a few more things over here that I never mess with, but you can. Um, I don't really understand a lot of this stuff. And then you just render it to a video like this. But I've already done that, so I don't need to. Um, it takes a while. It'll show you a little progress bar. Let me change this to like something else. Hey. But right here, let's see, rendering video progress. It's going to take a while um, because it has to render it. And that is, for the most part, um, every like my entire creative process um, for making my covers. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please leave them in the comments and I will do my best to answer them. Uh, thank you for watching and I uh, hope you enjoyed this.